Four former police officers have been charged with the unlawful death of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin, who was filmed pressing his knee on the neck of Mr Floyd, has been charged with second-degree murder. That's on top of his initial charges of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. The other officers, J. Alexander Kang, Thomas Lane and Tol Tao, have been charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter. So in this video, I'd just like to talk through the charges and the chances of conviction. First of all, what is second-degree murder? According to 2019 Minnesota Statute 609.19, murder in the second degree is defined as intentional murder, drive-by shootings, which carries a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. Obviously, we can rule out the second option here, drive-by shootings. So the remaining option is intentional murder. 1. Causes the death of a human being with intent to effect the death of that person or another, but without premeditation. I think it's clear that there was no premeditation. Premeditation would involve some sense of planning. For example, a sniper lying in wait. That certainly wasn't the case in this situation, hence why the police officers weren't charged with first-degree murder. But intent is a very hard thing to prove. We have to remember that in the United States criminal courts, there is a legal burden of proof on the prosecution. For murder trials, the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. That is, the prosecution are required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin intended to kill Mr Floyd, or in the case of the other officers, prove that they assisted in the intentional killing of Mr Floyd. That means the prosecution must remove any reasonable doubt in the mind of the 12-person jury that the defendant is guilty of intentional murder. Every member of the jury must have no doubt in their mind that Derek Chauvin was intent on killing Mr Floyd. Personally, I just don't see that happening. In my opinion, it's obvious the police were not trying to kill Mr Floyd. If that were true, you'd also have to assume that they were intent on going to prison. They knew they were being filmed. They knew there were witnesses. It makes no sense for them to intentionally kill Mr Floyd, and I doubt the prosecution could possibly prove it. I've been involved in murder trials, and intent, at least in Queensland law, isn't the easiest thing to prove at the best of times. It would have to be obvious and clear that the person's intent was to kill or cause grievous bodily harm to their victim. In the trial that I was involved in, a man stabbed his cousin in the heart, who later died. There were no witnesses that saw the actual incident, but the lady that died had stumbled into a party just before she passed out and told the partygoers that her cousin had just stabbed her. The police later found the man in a nearby park with blood on his hands. His fingerprints matched what was found on the weapon. There was no doubt in the jury's mind that the man killed his cousin. But was it intentional? Well, that was the thing that nobody was able to prove. It was a single stab wound. If there were like 20 stab wounds, then certainly we could argue that that was intentional. But with a single stab wound, where nobody witnessed it, there were plenty of scenarios that the jury members were able to dream up where he didn't intend to kill his cousin. As the judge pointed out, as long as the jury members were able to think of any other reasonable explanation that matched all the evidence, then this was not murder. Ultimately, the guy got nine years for manslaughter. It might sound unjust to some of you, but without this strict burden of proof, thousands of innocent people would go to jail. We have to have a high burden of proof when it comes to taking away a person's liberty for 30 or 40 years. Innocent until proven guilty. If we didn't have this system, we'd be no better than a dictatorship or despot that arbitrarily imprisons or executes their rivals. Remembering, the court will not just be presented with a single piece of evidence. Regarding the George Floyd case, most casual observers are relying on a single video they saw online to pass judgment. The court will not do this. They will be presented with all the pieces of information that led up to the death of George Floyd. Perhaps many viewers would like to ignore that information, but the court will not. The court does not pass judgment based on popular opinion. The court's decision is not influenced by how many protesters there are on the streets, and nor should it be. The court have only one thing to consider. 
the law. They look at the evidence presented to them and make a decision based on the law. The emotional response of millions of people online and on the streets does not change their decision-making process. If they didn't do this, then we are no longer living in a civilized society. We are living in some sort of banana republic that relies on the use of kangaroo courts. Modern-day Australian and American courts use the law to pass judgment on individuals based on the evidence presented to them. For example, the Minneapolis Police Department have a use of force policy, Policy 5300. This policy is obviously in the process of being updated, but that is not relevant to the court. At the time of George Floyd's death, appropriately trained Minneapolis police officers were allowed to employ chokeholds and neck restraints. Chokeholds are considered a deadly force option, but this was not what was employed during George Floyd's arrest. Neck restraints were employed, but are, or were, considered a non-deadly force option. First of all, I'd just like to comment on the use of the term non-deadly. Most police policy documents nowadays don't use the term non-deadly or non-lethal anymore. The more common term is less lethal. For example, spraying somebody in the face with pepper spray could potentially kill them, but usually not. So it is considered a less lethal option. Obviously, compressing somebody's neck isn't without its risks. It certainly should not be considered a non-deadly option. But at that time, it was, and that's what the court will consider. When it comes to the Minneapolis Police Department, a neck restraint is defined, or was defined, as compressing one or both sides of a person's neck with an arm or leg without applying direct pressure to the trachea or airway front of the neck. Only sworn employees who have received training from the MPD training unit are authorised to use neck restraints. The MPD authorises two types of neck restraints, conscious neck restraint and unconscious neck restraint. Whether or not Derek Chauvin was trained in its use, I suppose that will come out in court. A conscious neck restraint is defined as one where the subject is placed in a neck restraint with intent to control and not to render the subject unconscious by only applying light to moderate pressure. An unconscious neck restraint is defined as one where the subject is placed in a neck restraint with the intention of rendering the person unconscious by applying adequate pressure. Okay, so in court, this will certainly be brought up. The police were employing a tactic that they were potentially trained to use. Now that's not me saying that this is ethical, far from it, but if you're a police officer who was trained and told that a neck restraint is a non-deadly option, then that will certainly have some bearing in this murder trial. I'm not saying that it's right, I'm not saying that it's moral, but it was certainly part of the MPD's use of force policy. There's also a whole bunch of procedures and regulations outlining when neck restraints can be employed. Basically, it involves when the subject is actively resisting or being actively aggressive. Again, the public haven't got all of the video footage involved in the incident, so we can only go by what has been published online. But I presume the court will be presented with unseen footage taken from police body cameras, neighbouring stores, other people's mobile devices, etc. There's also the argument that the other officers involved should have intervened and pushed Derek Chauvin aside. Two of the officers, J. Alexander King and Thomas Lane, were rookies, having only started their police careers four days prior to Mr. Floyd's death. Derek Chauvin was their senior officer who had almost 19 years of police experience. It's easy for the media and the public to denounce these officers for not intervening, but let's think about it rationally for a second. Just say in the moment they honestly believed that Mr. Floyd was going to die if they didn't stop Derek Chauvin. So one of them pushes their senior officer off of Mr. Floyd's neck, remembering that these officers have potentially been taught that a neck restraint is a non-deadly option. It would be essentially like stopping your senior officer from using pepper spray. But just say they did push Derek Chauvin off and save Mr. Floyd's life. Would anybody have known that they saved his life? Would anybody have known that Mr. Floyd would have died if they didn't do what they did? I doubt it, but one thing I can nigh on guarantee you is the backlash that the rookie officers would have faced within the police force. Word would very quickly get around that they were willing to attack a fellow police officer in the line of duty. They certainly wouldn't have been able to prove either way if they were going to save Mr. Floyd's life. 
An internal investigation may even have found them guilty of intervening in a lawful arrest, resulting in them losing their jobs, or perhaps even worse. From their perspective, they couldn't have intervened without suffering a huge backlash. Unless their senior officer was doing something obviously illegal, like holding a knife to Mr Floyd's neck or something equally reckless, those officers were pretty much stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's unreasonable to expect rookie officers to go against their senior officers so early on in their career. To expect any rookie officer to do that is bordering on absurd. The police are a paramilitary force. You can't just go around disobeying your senior officers without huge negative consequences. I'm not saying that's how it should be, but that's certainly how it is. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. It's easy for us to say that they should have done this or they should have done that, but just think about it from their perspective. I'd be extremely surprised if any of these other officers actually get convicted for aiding and abetting murder, or even manslaughter for that matter, but that's something for the courts to work out. Another consideration is Floyd's actions and state of mind during the arrest. I won't go into those details here, because I don't want to speak ill of the dead, as I've indicated in Latin here. Mr Floyd has already paid the ultimate price, so I see no point in discussing his actions any further. However, the court will discuss his actions before and during his arrest. Although many casual observers play down these events, when it comes to a murder trial which could take away a man's freedom for the rest of his life, every detail matters. From Derek Chauvin's point of view, he probably treated a hundred other individuals in a similar way to how he treated George Floyd, and nobody died. That doesn't mean he's not guilty, but it does mean that he probably had no expectation that Mr Floyd would die that day. No expectation equals no intent. There is more to the second degree murder charge under Minnesota law. There is also something known as unintentional murder, which is more fitting to the Floyd case. This either requires the perpetrator to cause the death of somebody while committing or attempting to commit a felony offence, or while intentionally inflicting or attempting to inflict bodily harm upon the victim when the perpetrator is restrained under an order for protection. So basically, the victim has a restraining order against the perpetrator, which is not the case in this situation. So what about number one? Were the police officers committing or attempting to commit a felony? I think that would be a very hard thing to prove. An actual example of this might be an armed robber who is trying to steal somebody's wallet at the subway station. When he threatens his victim with a knife, the victim stumbles backwards and falls in front of a passing train. The robber wasn't intending on killing the person, but the person died because of the robber's actions while committing a felony, i.e. the armed robbery. I don't really think the police were attempting to commit a felony here, and certainly it would be a very hard thing to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So what's left? Well, there's still the third degree murder charge that has a maximum penalty of 25 years imprisonment. It does not require intent, and has two possible conditions. The second one here involves the selling or distributing of controlled substances, so that certainly isn't relevant here. The first one involves the person to cause the death of another by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. What's a depraved mind? Well, it's basically an inherent deficiency of moral sense and integrity. It consists of evil, corrupt, and perverted intent, which is devoid of regard for human dignity and which is indifferent to human life. It is a state of mind outrageously horrible or inhuman. Well, again, it's a hard thing to prove. Can we say that these police officers were devoid of moral integrity? Many onlookers might say that they were, but can it be proven in court beyond a reasonable doubt? Did two rookie officers completely lose all sense of morals after being on the job for only four days? Well, that's something for the prosecution to try to prove. There's also the fact that there are competing autopsies over the cause of Mr Floyd's death. One states that he didn't die from asphyxiation, the other states that he did. But both autopsies agree that he died, at least in part, due to the actions of the police officers during the arrest. But remember the burden of proof? The jury must be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of what actually happened. Conflicting autopsies doesn't seem to indicate to me that the cause of death is beyond a reasonable doubt. 
And finally, there's the second degree manslaughter charge, which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years imprisonment. The first option involves culpable negligence. The next one involves shooting and killing a person because you mistakenly believed that they were an animal. Obviously, that doesn't apply here. The third one involves the setting of a spring gun or trap. Again, not relevant here. The fourth one involves negligently failing to keep a vicious animal confined. And the last one involves the neglect or endangerment of a child. Obviously, only the first condition is applicable to the George Floyd case regarding culpable negligence whereby the person creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes chances of causing death or great bodily harm to another. What will actually happen in the trial? What evidence will be presented? I don't know. But the overarching point being is that nothing is set in stone here. Ultimately, the prosecution have to prove their case. Just because we saw a video that many casual observers have labelled as murder doesn't mean that the perpetrators will be found guilty of murder. My only warning to those of you hoping for a guilty verdict is that criminal cases conducted against the actions of police officers while performing their legal duties rarely result in the desired or expected outcome. Be prepared to be upset by the result. Mm -hmm.